Today, I'm sitting with Todd. Todd, tell us what you do on a daily basis. <laughs> on a daily basis, I have um, I take care of a, a family. There's three others of us. I've got a wife and two kids. And um, so part of my day is just the family things and being with them. Uh, the other part of the day is uh, running the business, and we make... Uh, Peel and stick nipple covers, nice. of all things. Yeah. And um, uh, I do that, mm-hmm. and you know, designing and um, just all the different hats that you could wear in a business. <laughs> you mm-hmm. know, every everything from production processes to how they look to photo shoots to trade shows, uh, website you know, marketing meetings. I do a couple times a week with different teams. I, we've just, uh, we've kind of built out this category. So it's grown quite a bit in 18 years and Mm -hmm. there's a lot to do with that. But, um, I try to split it, you know, pretty evenly between, uh, family and family and business. We try to have as much fun as we work, Mm -hmm. you know, why nipple covers, (laughs) Well, what could be better you know, <laughs> than than boobs? My my dad was always a big boob fan, and uh-huh. um, we um, he always told me to do you know as I was getting older in high school age to make sure I figure out what to do with my life and to do something that I like, uh-huh. you know. And so I took that pretty literally, and. Um, <laughs> Both my interests at the time were uh, cartoons and boobs, <laughs> uh, women, you know, <laughs> totally, or, or you know, girls or whatever, uh-huh. relative to that age. So, uh, how did you? What was your childhood like? Um, my childhood was, I'd say, you know, I had a pretty good childhood overall. Um, I mean, I can't complain at all. It's a pretty dreamy compared to a lot of people I grew up with and mm-hmm. kids. And um, it's funny, my wife actually says the same. We we both would consider our our parents good parents, you mm-hmm. know, good examples of parenting. And we try to do some of what they did, but not all. And, um, um, but, you know, but yeah, both my parents worked real hard and, and um, kind of did everything for us and, and as far as holding a space for us to, you know, grow up in and, and, uh, and become adult like people. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So, you know, grew up in kind of a s- suburbia of LA in Rancho Cucamonga. That's a cool name. Yeah. <laughs> Rancho Cucamonga. Bugs Bunny talks about Cucamonga sometimes. Uh huh. You'll see in Cucamonga. And, um, yeah, I, I'm just trying to think. So we grew up kind of in suburbia, and my parents, my dad was a salesman. He sold staple guns for Senko when I was real young and got into landscaping on the side and aspired to get his own business started. And uh, my mom kind of pushed him into that a little later when mm-hmm. I was maybe, uh, I was probably... I don't know, nine, nine or 10 mm-hmm. when he started that business. And it, um, it was just, I watched my dad as a entrepreneur, you know, sort of taking those risks and from my, you know, childhood eyes or whatever, it looked like, um, he, you know, they made it look easy. Like, Oh, that's just the natural thing you do. Like, okay. They decided to start a business landscaping people's yards or whatever. And at first it was just, you know, getting individual sort of custom jobs, doing a guy's front yard or backyard and, um, that kind of stuff. But it quickly grew into doing, you know, entire tracks of homes, um, street medians, parks, schools. And, um, he ended up retiring, uh, he was a little older than I am now. He's, I think he was in his late 40s when he retired. Um, and basically, you know, built up a lot of um, kind of the San Bernardino County area as far as all the suburban sprawl went. Mm-hmm. 
promptly moved away, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> up to uh, up to northern Nevada, where uh, it was kind of like it was when he started, you know. <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah. Um, so that you know, being raised by them and watching them kind of work hard and play hard, it was something that you know we we always counted those blessings and and it's like you it's not it's not easy but it's super rewarding you know totally. so that was that was kind of my um i was always an entrepreneur myself too because of that and started selling stuff door to door when i was i think 8 years old um and always you know like everyone doing the lemonade stands yeah. and selling stuff on the on the corner selling candy or lemonade or whatever, you know, whatever we want to make. And, um, I sold, you know, greeting cards door to door. And, um, you know, as I got older, I'm sorry. Oh, you're totally good. Rude of me to... Is that Nightcrawler? That's a uh, Knight Rider. Knight yeah. Rider. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it. she just called me back. So sorry about that. Oh, totally. I'm gonna keep that in. Yeah, I like it. <laughs> yeah, that's my that's my ring. My um, and I have an, my R2 unit uh, uh-huh. alerts me in most of my texts. So. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yeah, but uh, you know, I just watching them do what they did. Um, they they went on tons of vacations. You know, they're always going on some other vacation off to Jamaica or somewhere in the Caribbean, and mm-hmm. they still do. They're still always vacationing and. Um, it's like, yeah, I want to do that, you know, and I'd watch other people I'm growing up with and, and how hard some people work for other people, Mm -hmm. you know, and, um, and they all do good and stuff, but it's just, uh, I guess that's where I get this, um, sort of resistance to being on other people's clocks. Totally. (laughs) Here's a quote for you that Jim Carrey said is, uh, no matter what you do in life, you're going to fail. So fail at doing what you love. Yes. I love that. Yes. And I've done that. Mm -hmm. I've done that for sure. Um, and yeah, and I still love it. Mm -hmm. You know, some of these things that I've, I've failed pretty hard at and, uh, um, yeah, yeah. It was just sort of a thing. I didn't want to be on anybody else's, uh, clock. So I better figure out how to make my own totally. way, you know, and I better enjoy doing it. Uh-huh. So at that point it was, you know, kind of like you. And I don't know if your audience knows this, that your interest in cartooning, drawing mm-hmm. and animation, totally. um, a lot like you, it's just like, man, I, I of course grew up watching great cartoons and I really loved Looney Tunes. I loved the older ones. Um, and kind of a purist, you know, that way as a kid, like I want to be in that. And mm-hmm. I was so close to it in LA, it's it just felt like it was within reach to somehow get into animation and making films and movies and stuff, and uh, and so it was like. But boobs were a little bit more prioritized. <laughs> At that point, they weren't because <laughs> uh, you know I was actually raised Mormon, mm-hmm. and um, so you know what kind of Jack Mormon we weren't like going all the time or, or, you know, ultra religious as, as some of the Mormons get, but that was just sort of like our religious foundation, you know, a Christian foundation for all intents and purposes. And, uh, just, you know, we were raised pretty normally or whatever. And then I ended up in art school, Mm -hmm. you know, after I graduated high school, I didn't get into, um, Cal Arts, mm-hmm. the school I wanted to go to, and um, we. So I got into art school on my second try. I worked for my dad's landscape company for a year, and um, to kind of like bide my time down there and work on my portfolio when I wasn't mowing lawns mm-hmm. and you know trimming trees and stuff. And um, when I finally got into school. Um, you know, it's probably the, one of the most liberal schools there is by Mm -hmm. definition and almost a polar opposite of how I was raised. I can't say polar opposite, um, cause 
like I said, you know, dad was always whistling at the boobs on TV or, <laughs> you know, hey, check her out, check her out, you know, yeah. and, and just kind of, you know, all in good fun. He wasn't like too over the top. That wasn't maybe till later in his life, but um, it was just like, you know, and he was always super respectful of my mom and never, you know, went out on her or anything like that. It was just purely like, man, she's she's beautiful check her out you know mm -hmm. and he'd always be he's a pretty loud guy so he you know not a lot of filter there and um so anyways i'm all over the place no that's be the whole point <laughs> yeah whole point being at being at this art school you know i get there the first day and i'm looking out my dorm room and there's a pool in the middle of all the dorms and half the girls in there are just buck naked. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, yeah, I like this place. <laughs> I can get used to this <laughs> yeah, place. Yeah. Okay. I'll get into this. And, um, and just the, just the whole, this whole ethos, you know, I'd never really been exposed to it less, much less submerged in it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, the animation school, the character animation school there is probably the most reserved group of artists there. They tend to be introverted, you mm -hmm. know, a, a, an animator, a character animator, specifically at least 25 years ago or something when I was there. Um, and they're kind of the nerdy bunch, you know? Mm -hmm. So that was almost kind of where I was coming from. Cause, um, that's just kind of who I was at that point, you know, and wanted to, wanted to do something magical, like, like the nine old men were doing, uh, mm -hmm. at Disney and like the Warner brothers guys, like, you know, at that point there hadn't quite been anything that was touching what the original Warner brothers guys we're doing, you know, um, you know, Mel Blanc and Chuck Jones mm -hmm. and, and Schlesinger and all, all these different classic cartoon, uh, moguls. Um, and so it's like, that's, you know, that's what I want to do. I want to, you know, I want to make it like it used to be, make it good. Like it used to be. Cause you know, kind of got notoriously cheap through the seventies and, Especially now, too. In the eighties, and like, and now, yeah, it's it's totally they. You can't. They mask a lot of the lack of talent with, um, different computer stuff. Totally. Like I was, I was actually about this the other day. It's like, how come there's no like, Little Mermaid type animation anymore? You know, it's all right. CGI, three D. Yeah. yeah, and they yeah they pretty much de facto, do um, the CGI, but. I think the new, the Space Jam, I haven't seen Space Jam that just came out was, uh, I saw one of my friends on Instagram was talking about um, how they did that traditionally. Oh, really? They, they drew it. And um, I'm sure they drew it on, you know, big Wacoms or whatever. But, yeah. Um, and um, my good friend's animation studio, they still draw everything by hand, you know, but they'll draw like a nice shape and they'll move and morph that shape around more mm -hmm. often than not than as opposed to the totally organic style that you see from Glenn Keane yeah. in the little mermaid, you know, like he's like, everything's an S curve and you look at his drawings yeah. and they're just these big scribbles, but you roll them all together and, and you see this life come out of these totally. sc scribbles. When I draw on my <laughs> iPad, I feel like I'm cheating yeah. almost. Cause I can just like, <laughs> undo yeah <laughs> scale make it bigger uh-huh you know and and that's and that's i think you know you have to be careful that make sure you stay like get down and paint on some paper draw on some paper and you have to force yourself to deal with those imperfections yeah you can't go back you know totally like put some black ink on white paper and and uh that's that's pretty bold you mm -hmm. know to do that to sit down and like next door in a in a figure drawing workshop or something and um take a black pen and put it down on your paper totally. and just start drawing unreservedly you know mm -hmm. like um that's that's where it's that's where it's at that's where you really get the 
the hum- the life comes out totally. that way because the imperfections are woven into your intentions. And I like you, that. And you get like a whole like complete picture at the end that isn't quite what you thought it would be. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, at least the first time you look at it and then it changes the second and third time. And then you look at it the next day or the next week and um, you're like, whoa, you know, when, when you've forgotten or let go of your preconceptions of what the drawing was in your head and you come back for me, like I just plain forgot what I was thinking. And I look at that like, man, I did a good job on that one. <laughs> when at the time that I had done, it, it's like, oh, eh, you know, yeah. next. And, um, and sometimes I, I come back and like, oh, I really like that drawing now. But, um, yeah, usually also though, when you, when you have a good one, it usually just stays really good, you know, totally, it comes totally. Out good. So, um, I, I, uh, that's one of the things I miss most about my, uh, animation career is figure drawing. Mm-hmm. And, uh, it was at, at first as a sophomore in high school, and maybe a freshman and, to find a figure drawing class in my suburban town um, was kind of hard, especially being a kid, you know, looking to to go draw naked ladies that just most likely wasn't going to (laughs) happen. You know, my parents weren't artists or anything and they didn't understand what, you know, my, my grandma was, she did a little bit of that and she was like the artistic one that I'd relate to and learned a lot about art from as a young kid. Um, but, you know, I, I started looking at anim, animation, and it's like, well, if you're going to be good at, you want to draw cartoons, you have to be really good at drawing the human figure, mm-hmm. you know, because every cartoon is personified. It doesn't matter what animal or plant or human or whatever, but it's going to be drawn with two arms and two legs, and it's going to walk and swing its arms, and we're going to relate to it because it's human looking, mm-hmm. you know. Uh, at the very least, it's going to talk and have human facial features embedded in it you know and almost every cartoon has that and like kind of dawned on me like oh yeah i guess <laughs> that's yeah. the case and then but it's like god how boring is he- figure drawing you know like totally <laughs> i remember listening to a podcast when i was in high school about like animators talking they were like take anatomy and physiology if you're in high school right now take it and i was like Pfft whatever yeah these guys don't know what they're talking yeah. about and i look back i was like damn i really wish i would have <laughs> took that class i would have helped out a lot yeah and i did take their advice and i did take anatomy and it was a really easy class for me because that was probably my third year in high school or something at that point i'd already been drawing quite a bit mm-hmm. and was genuinely interested in what these parts are called that i've been drawing you know or where this bone sticks up here and how this you know where the bones meet the skin and like all those things were um, interesting. And so it was easy to, when I, Oh, that's the name of it. That's a patella or a clavicle or, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. And, um, and it was, you know, kind of useful or whatever, (laughs) but, (laughs) but it's like, you know, I don't know if my life would have changed too much without that class. Mm -hmm. Um, but, uh, I don't know where I was going with that figure drawing we mm-hmm. were talking about. And that's what I miss the most. Cause it's, I, I didn't like it at first. And once I started, once I got to Cal arts, I met my mentor, Corny Cole, who, um, is, he was an old, old timer. He passed away almost, uh, I think 10 years ago. I think it was 2008. Um, I could be, don't quote me on that. Mm-hmm. But um, I met him as a junior in high school, and he just he had a Saturday night figure drawing thing that would go till midnight. So I'd drive an hour and a half out to Ventura, um, Valencia, excuse me, and um, I would draw with him for th- three hours or so, three or four hours, and whoever else was the students there drawing but um he really got me got my head wrapped around the a lot of the uh the emotions around drawing 
and mm-hmm. the um, the importance of your emotional state and stuff when you're drawing. Totally. You know, he was real. He, you know, you'd call him artsy farty if you saw him, <laughs> and, and he was like, you know, the the oldest hippie in the world. He's like one of the first surfers on Malibu. Wow. Like legit first sur- surfer. That's crazy. He had a twin brother too, and um, he had long gray ponytail and all hunched over because at that point he was in his you know early 70s i think mid 70s and um you know he was just he'd he'd tell us um uh how to how to draw how to see it you know Mm -hmm. and it was more about what you it was more about letting go of the preconceptions and um he you know hated structural drawing you know where you draw a box a three-dimensional box and you draw around it and that kind of stuff and it's like okay you gotta let go of that now that's you know (laughs) we got to get on to something else and he was all about you know switch your hands draw right-handed draw with both hands uh go outside and get a stick and tie a pen to it (laughs) draw with that you know sit on the floor stand up over there and draw sit down over here you know and really like getting out of all these these um devices you know you'll see a lot of kids draw um people and they have a style you know we all have a style you can't avoid it but there's um like devices and stuff that people go to like this is how you draw a hand three quarters Uh your face three quarters right right no matter what face they're looking at the proportions are the same and yeah. it doesn't ever looks like the face or it does, but it's like their characterized version of it. And, um, he was really railing against that, you know, mm-hmm. like get out of these, um, he's really kind of an anti Glenn Vilpu in a lot of ways. And who was, he had a lot of sort of constructionist tendencies from what I know of him. I never took one of his classes, but had lots of friends that drew with him and, drew like him um but corny was he was more of um he was taking expressionism to the next place Mm -hmm. you know and so was mike mitchell who is my other mentor there and um uh you know i i should pass this on to somebody before i die what they gave me you know Mm -hmm because they're both super accomplished artists in all their different ways. I, uh, Mike, um, Mike Mitchell. Um, yeah, he's, he's just, he's a great artist in, in his own right. And they both had a very, um, <clears throat> they were in a similar school of style. I mm-hmm. don't know. They just happened to be, you know, and they were both at Cal arts and, teaching us to draw in ways that nobody else nobody else did or would i'm sure some of my fellow students uh are teaching are teaching it so that's good but um you know i hope to get into a a figure drawing class or you know host a workshop or just be part of a class one day and draw in a class with people some more um to to sort of we all share our styles you know yeah. we all draw and then we walk around and then we look at how everybody else sees it and um you know we learn things and we see we learn about devices and you know how it, just how people are finding their lines i guess you know and it's really not hard is the thing and mm-hmm. they, this is what they it took me most of 10 years of drawing with them to understand that uh, um, it's it's all about most of the stuff is stripping away you know you learn stuff pretty quickly you know you can open a book you can take a class uh, you can learn how to draw the, the three-dimensional blocks with pretty good confidence pretty quickly but it's hard to forget that it, it starts coming out in your stuff when you learn these devices mm-hmm. and so then it's about like being okay with not having that stuff around when when it's time to put the line down totally and then and, and then being brave enough to like just do that even if you're not looking at the paper you know you kind of put your put your pencil down you start moving it and you, you better be looking at that model 
don't you know and you look down a little bit you could check in you know but just let it go just like let it go and some really cool things happen totally um the line starts you know it starts moving like it should and you don't need multiple drawings to have movement you know is the is the lesson and then you know that said corny has an amazing uh, life's work of a single film that he worked on um and each cell was a um an ink drawing like a full just freehand ink drawing Mm -hmm. and um i don't know this movie goes on for i think like 20 minutes or more of just scene after scene of him just straight ahead animation in these each each 24th of a second is a drawing he probably spent at least three or four hours on wow you know that's crazy (laughs) yeah (laughs) and you watch this movement you know because he draw you he draws in this expressionist way, but when you stack all those up, you know, mm-hmm. something else starts to happen. And like this, um, a really beautiful sort of living thing comes out of this artwork, literally, you know, that's what's so great about animation is it's really the newest art form. I don't know if it's still the newest art form considering all the stuff in the last 20 years, but, mm-hmm. um, in a lot of ways it is and we're still learning a lot about the illusion of life Mm -hmm. you know and how to how to make something look like you (laughs) you know like like we're kind of trying to emulate god's great work and like maybe we're we're trying to like you know we're learning about ourselves but you know this animation when you start animating or make it you have this character in mind and you put it down and it's you see it move around for the first time it separates from you it's like this a what's that the cells that you know those little microorganisms that divide the asexual yeah. division you know like you birth this little creature that has its own life that other people can have opinions about and you know, talk about and imagine, uh, about, and it's out of you now. It's not yours anymore. Totally. You know, that's the finished film really is that too. Like the finished film is it's your baby going out to the world and I hope you do good, you know, because there's nothing else you can do about it now. Yeah, (laughs) totally. And, uh, and, and I think there's, there, it's a natural human evolution. We'll, we continue to do that with robotics and AI and all these things to, you know, pretend like we're gods, you know, to um, at least try to act like demigods and mm-hmm. and create life like, you know, like our bodies do. I don't know, even know if we're, you know, what what our role in that creation is. I have some guesses, but... Um, you know, that's really these bodies that we didn't create are creating more life, but we have this intention inside that has a desire to emulate that. Yeah. It seems like, you know, that's deep. Yeah. I like that. <laughs> yeah. Well, you warned me we we're going to, we we're going to yeah. get deep. Well, so. totally. If you wanna get, <laughs> let's, let's go for it. So let me ask you the podcast questions. Okay. All right. Why is there birth? How come it leads to death? And what's the point of the stuff in between? All right. Just like the title says, huh? Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's pretty deep. That's that's a lot to bite off. How much more time do we have? As much as you got. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Who's going to listen to this, this podcast <laughs> go on for five hours? Uh, uh, let's start with the beginning i guess the first question is why are we born yeah um so i think you know like why do we drink why do we eat Mm -hmm. you know because we have an appetite for Mm -hmm. it and so i think we each of us um chose 
to come here because I because I wanted to, you know, yeah. <laughs> kind of thing is the answer. Um, so. So you don't think that life happens to you? It happens for you, or you have you start life for yourself? Yeah, it's just as I don't think it's much different than turning on the PS4, you know, and like yeah. trying out around a Fortnite or Need for Speed or something. TM, I'm not sponsored. Yeah, I'm not but, sponsored. <laughs> <laughs> but no, just kidding. Um, but you know, it's just like we're playing this game to learn more about ourselves or ourself maybe there's only one mm-hmm. you know and um and yeah we're we're just uh we're playing yeah we're playing totally well, like i said this on the last episode and i think it's it's true it's like like the simulation theory right it's totally. we only see it as the simulation because that's what we live in right now so like quote unquote God, right, gives us the hints to the simulation theory because that's what's in the forefront of our evolution right now is technology. Uh-huh. And so of course we're gonna think of like technology as a simulation versus like a thousand years ago. I don't know what religion is. I was trying to think of it last episode and I still can't think of it. I wanna say Buddhism, where they think that all reality is is the dream of a giant baby floating through space. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah. Something like uh yeah. yeah. It's, I'm pretty sure it's not Buddhism though. I know it's not Buddhism. It's something like that, but like, cause back then they didn't have computers. So that's what they kind of like thought of. And now in the age of computers, that's what we can only relate it to. And then a thousand years from now, we'll be like, Oh, it's that because of this, you know? Yeah. So that's what I think when it comes to simulation theory. (laughs) Yeah. And I'm, I'm kind of with you on that. I think there is some sort of, um, simulation going on here. Mm Mm-hmm. For sure. There's there's a lot of unresolved things um, empirically, you know, in our in our world here that, Mm -hmm. um, you know, all is not as it appears. Totally. Yeah. Too much weird shit happens, you know? (laughs) Yeah. This whole thing about synchronicity, you know, and in coincidences, there's um, yeah, I'm I firmly, I guess, firmly believe there is no coincidences, you know, Mm -hmm. It's a veil of some kind that we're <clears throat> just outside of, and maybe we're trying to drop ourselves hints or beat ourselves over the heads with, you know, you know, come on, you know, get this right. Yelling yeah. at our avatar, you know, from yeah. the other side of the veil. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Yeah, and you can't do anything about it because I guess we had this deal that we didn't know where we're coming from or where we're going. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it had to be scary or or wouldn't we wouldn't learn anything that's true you know like that's one of the questions i'd ask you later but i'll just say now it's like that's what i think deja vu is yeah is totally like being like hey man what the fuck you doing Uh or like dude you're doing such a great job look at you like you're (laughs) on the right path you're doing great yeah it's like what do you think deja vu is Uh uh-huh well that kind of reminds me of 11 11 you know and um you you know about this you like follow where you wish at 11 11 well, it's just it's a it's kind of a synchronicity thing of seeing eleven eleven, um, you know, once or twice a day, um, or every day you see eleven eleven at morning or night, um, or one eleven. Um, these sort of markers that appear in your life, you know, mm-hmm. that that yeah maybe give these signals to you like how do you feel when you see that you know when you mm-hmm. see eleven eleven, do you feel like you know, to me, I feel like, oh, I must be doing the right thing right now. Or, um, yeah, just like, okay, I'm on the right track or, you know, keep going like this, not like that. Or, yeah. <laughs> you know, may- maybe it's something like that. Uh-huh. Um, and then, you know, for the deja vu kind of works into that for me, uh, similarly where it's like, um, uh, yeah, you've, you've done this before. Um, but really it does feel like, um, I'm, I'm kind of turning a corner cause maybe it, maybe it's, it's not always that though. For me with deja vu, it's very literal, you know, it's like, like I've had this interchange before and it, 
you know, you said that same thing and you were standing up a little higher or it was just like this, you know. Um, so maybe that, maybe that isn't quite as related to coincidence or synchronicity as it is to the nature of time, the cyclical nature of time, where it's like any other vibration, it repeats. Yeah. You know, it's, it's circular, it's, an, it's wave-like. You it's know? totally, because like the example I bring up to people to try to explain it, that what you're saying, because I totally believe with you, or I'm with you, is if time had a beginning and an end, we would never exist, because we'd already be done. Right. Because like if we're right here. Right. Right. I guess you can't see. But like if like imagine a pencil and you're at the number two marker because we're almost at the end of time for whatever reason. Right. And then you pass to the eraser. Then none of that ever existed. And reality is over. Then we couldn't be present. We couldn't have memories because everything would already be done. Be done. Or hasn't even begun yet. You know, it's a good point. So I totally believe that time does not have an ending. There's no way. Yeah. So, and that's, that's really profound. Mm -hmm. You know, I hadn't uh, really considered that before. I don't remember. Like, have you ever been, are you in a pool right now? No, I'm not. You're not in a pool, right? Yeah. Because it's ended. It's done. You're not a killer to no more because it's ended. It's done. But you can still think of that, right? You can still remember it because it's still a real thing. And so if time has an ending, right? Like it would be not the same thing if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. So we're might be, we might be like sensing a harmonic vibration of our mo- moment in time, mm-hmm. right? Like you strum a guitar and you can kind of see two or three strings that appear where one was, yeah. you yeah. know, and it's kind of like maybe your kind of mental uh, outlook or, or perception is sort of blurred or vibrating you know um at that moment um but it's fun to think about totally yeah well like you should be proud you're about to be proud i hope so okay because you told me to check this person out and i do and now they're like probably like my one of my three favorite people in the whole existence all right david lynch all right i love david lynch (laughs) i knew it his movies and like (laughs) like what he talks about with meditation and intuition i'm all all on board with what he's saying <laughs> yeah and yeah. you know he's from here he no. wasn't born here but he lived here for two years when he was like three no I think. kidding yeah huh I watched a movie it's called it's on youtube i'm sure it's on another thing it's called like the art of life or something it's basically just a documentary about his whole life and okay. he's like he like narrates it and it's really good all right man yeah i, I love that i'll have to check check it out totally yeah Learn more about the David Lynch. Oh, it's, yeah. it's a lot to unpack. That's a whole another podcast episode yeah. for sure. So, how why does it lead to death? <laughs> you know, we like we can talk, we love, we lost, or we lose, we do all this stuff, but then yeah. we're given birth for some reason, but then we also get all of this taken away for some other reason, or quote unquote taken away. Uh huh. Uh huh. Well, it's probably. It's probably the only way that makes sense for God to get to know himself. Hmm. Because, you know, the way I see it, we're kind of like appendages of a larger mass, a larger body. You know, like a little, I'm a little finger of of God and you're maybe the another one, you know? <laughs> yeah. And we're we're out here just sort of experiencing ourselves as fingers, not realizing our our full awareness until we pass back through that that veil and and kind of consider what we've learned. Mm-hmm. You know? Um I think it's important for us to um It's important for us to die so we can, you know, have other experiences as we can amalgamate these experiences into our soul that's a separate, you know, obviously separate from this current body I'm in. Um, But I think that, you know, it's probably a high likelihood that I've occupied a number of different bodies in different times 
maybe this one five minutes ago, a hundred years ago or something, yeah. you know, <laughs> kind of like, yeah, like we're, it's just like this vibration. It, it, I guess in, in the strict sense of a vibration, we would have to be, uh, repeating certain aspects of ourselves through different lifetimes. Um, I, um, yeah. So I think, you know, I think we die to kind of like make another painting, mm -hmm. I have you to know, pull up my phone so I can change pictures. So keep talking, please. Yeah. I think, I think we have to, you know, how boring would it be just to do one drawing and then yeah. never draw again, you know, totally like, like we, we want to do this. We don't just want to play the game one time and yeah, that was fun. I'm never going to play again, you know, and you and I may have played different ways and in, yeah. in, in different times, you know, and, and all these other interchanges that we all have and these dynamics that we enjoy. Um, we, you know, maybe every soul on earth, why, why shouldn't we have cross paths? Yeah. You know, in other incarnations back to, uh, times we don't even know about because that, that's a whole nother subject, but yeah. I've heard people say like, uh, there's like a soul family or I've heard people say like, and like, I kind of on, am on board on this a little bit uh -huh. is that some people aren't necessarily real and conscious versus that some people are. Cause like you go to Walmart and you see some people and you're just like, <laughs> how does that make sense? So I got to show you this real quick. Okay. Since we're talking someone about deja vu and I've mentioned this on my podcast before and you can vouch for me now. Yes. It's cause I went to CalArts, right? Yes. And I went into the underground area with all the painting sub levels. Yeah. Yes. Because we snuck in there and I saw this thing on the wall and it said caterpillars are scary and it's scary. Like I had the most intense deja vu i've had to this day and it was like a really warm nice fuzzy feeling uh -huh. like i was like i'm i'm on the right path i belong here yeah almost feeling <laughs> and so you can vouch me that's at you know that's oh real. yeah that's the sub level all right totally yeah anything goes in the sub level <laughs> you can paint on all the walls yeah i see it's right under a a funny drawing of bert uh-huh bert nernia there that reminds me of um a child a and yeah child, children illustrator it's like that's oh like the the caterpillars or yes i know a book you're talking about yeah it it has a similar yeah color so i don't uh, want to believe that though that's no you, you don't have to believe that. i'm not believing that <laughs> our my brain is just trying to wire it that way because uh -huh. there's no fun in that no you know no no that's yeah that's that's what happens yeah so what do you think is after death so, um, after death, I think there's, uh, what do I currently believe? Uh, maybe it's like, um, you know, it's a trans dimensional sort of adventure mm -hmm. where we are, our soul and our, our body have to disconnect at that point. And so, you know, the consciousness, the consciousness shifts out of this plane you know uh, traditionally uh in the different religions and spiritual beliefs people tend to point upwards you know about where that dimension is um and um it you know it might be six inches upward or you know it just it might like when we dream you know you you know I think we typically, sometimes we all have had that thing where we're falling back into yeah. our body or we're ascending out of it as we fall asleep. Totally. Or we're, we're halfway asleep and we, we kind of have that falling sensation. And that's an upward movement, yeah. you know? Yeah. And I think it has something to do with that. Totally. Yeah. And then I would, and then I'll add on to that. Yes. With when we feel depressed and anxious it's a sucking down feeling really lowering yeah. your vibration you good could point. say yeah you know yeah good point because i that's what i that's what a hippie chick and i i really want to get her on here i know where she works i don't have to go talk to her <laughs> I know where she works <laughs> yeah it was like she totally told me that it's like the reason we feel depression and anxiety is because our soul is trying to tell our body that you we are not at the right spot 
in our life right now. It's like, hey, dude, like you're not supposed to be doing this. Yeah. Like, why are you like you're not supposed to be working here or doing this or doing that? You're on the wrong path. Yes. And I totally am with her on that. I love it. <laughs> that's a good point. I mean, that's that's what it means, you know, to listen to our gut. Is the intuition, yeah, right? Yeah. That's the intuition, and that's the, um, you know, that's the that's the brain and the heart and the stomach speaking to each other. There's, you know, as many nerve endings they have found in your heart as there is in your brain. Totally. You know, or some similar number. But they're they're finding out that there is we feel emotions in these different organs or chakras, areas of our body because there's a there's an electric interchange happening there, you know, and you know on the mystical or spiritual side of it, there's we've all heard the advice to listen to your gut, you know, mm-hmm. like follow your heart <laughs> and <laughs> like all this stuff. And it's like, literally do that, you know, (laughs) like you feel that anxiety, um, think about what you're doing and where you're, where you're at right now. Maybe, Mm -hmm. you know, I don't know, maybe you need to turn and look behind you or something like this. Um, but listening, our, our emotions are, are signaling us very much so to, um, to, uh, go, go certain directions, you know, maybe that's. That's part of our avatar. That's part of our game. Totally. (laughs) So as, how do you think someone who doesn't do art could benefit from doing art? Yeah. Yeah. I'm trying to convince my wife all the time to come to figure drawing with me. And, um, she, uh, really hasn't seen me. She's seen a lot of my figure drawings. I don't know if she's a big fan or not of my, my style, my artwork, um, besides that's besides the point. It's been like, I really want to go and do some figure drawing, you know, and I can draw her. I can only concentrate for so long till I just want to jump her bones. So it's a <laughs> little, it's a little different. And, um, you know, when I try to draw her, then it has been anybody else, anybody else, even including my ex-wife. Mm -hmm. And I just, I have a hard time drawing my wife Mm -hmm. and, um, I don't know why, you know, cause (laughs) Cause uh, she's so beautiful. Yeah, (laughs) she is like really beautiful. Uh And that's probably it. I used to, I remember drawing like the, the models at school and there's a couple that were just like, damn, they're really cute, you know? And they get some of these poses and these things. and, And it's just like, it's really easy to sit in there for six hours and draw, you know, (laughs) with them and, um, and that, but you, you also get distracted. You know, I get distracted by the, you know, I used to get distracted by their, their beauty, you know, because I want to capture that beauty, you know, and, and if I didn't capture it, then I, 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 that drawing was just, I couldn't stand it, you know, (laughs) like, because it's not as pretty as she is. Totally, totally. You know, um, and then, of course, as a man drawing drawing men, um, and I think even a woman would agree with me that men are so much easier to draw totally. because they aren't beautiful. Yeah, you know, in my opinion, men are the 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 nature of a man is corners and lines, straight lines and corners, and you know, um, it, very definite. And uh, a woman is more ethereal, and she has S curves. Everything sweeps back and away again. And, you know, it doesn't matter which way you turn her. She has all these amazing curves. Mm-hmm. And, and yeah, femininity to me is the hardest thing to capture, you know, um, and also the most fascinating, so easy to practice over and over. Yeah. Um, so I don't know what that has to do with me being able to draw her or not, but I've been wanting her to come draw with me, Yeah, you know, and she's, I don't draw. I'm not, I don't care about drawing. I'm not somebody who draws whatever and totally get that. That's not why I'm asking you to come, Mm -hmm. you know, it's, I'm asking you to come. Like I ask you to come to a workout or a yoga class with me or, or something, you know, 
that's that's how I look at it. Mm-hmm. Is is it? And I always describe it as yoga, like brain yoga, or mind or soul yoga is probably a better uh, term, um, because it takes an incredible amount of concentration for an extended period of time. Um, if you're going to do anything worth looking at, and um, that focus takes you know energy and power, but when you're done creating with that focus and you see what you've put down on paper uh for better and worse you know even if it's a bad drawing you're still happy you did it you know you're still not like oh i wish i didn't come to class today and i don't know maybe there's i've had some classes but far and few between where it's just like just like a workout or yoga you're going to get something out of it for showing up you know And so I think everybody can benefit that way. And that's what I was talking about, the type of class that I would like to expose people to, excuse the pun, is is this idea that um, uh, of seriously not drawing for the finished product. I mean, we can all say, oh, I don't draw for the finished product. Um, But really, really like, you know, you're going to want to keep your drawings, but that's not the reason to to go there and do it it's to um it's it gives you it gives you focus it gives you human connection in a lot of uh, a lot of ways obviously you're you're staring at a human um but you are human and so you're sort of mimicking this idea of creation and life you are literally creating, um, but you're you're admiring a creation that is very mysterious, and and you know it's like the ultimate mystery is looking at any human body and really studying it and going over all the lumps and bumps and corners. Um, whether you look at your paper or not, and like it's a cohesive drawing, who gives a shit? <laughs> you know, it's it's like okay, maybe you get a good drawing and you could sell it for a hundred bucks or five thousand or whoever you are. But um, this this act of doing it, everybody needs to do that. You know, everybody needs to feel what a good stretch feels like, as totally. much as they should feel the the satisfaction of the creative process. You know, and it doesn't have to be stressful or judgmental the the biggest part the biggest hump for most people especially new people to drawing or people that quote i'm not an artist or i'm not somebody who draws everybody creates i don't care what you do you you're creating you're designing you know you're you're building something yeah steve Jobs says everything's art yeah yeah i i totally agree with steve Mm -hmm. and this um this um, is, is something that yeah everybody everybody needs to try out you know and just like go draw something and and throw it away if you don't like it but just like do yourself the justice of <coughs> excuse me of just don't judge yourself for a minute so you can get the benefit of this act. Um, beyond like having something you're proud of it's not it's not about the pride you Mm -hmm. know you don't do a you know you don't i don't know it's about the journey not the destination i guess so yeah as 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 cliche as that might seem yes that's what i'm saying (laughs) well that's the same thing like meditation almost i feel like a lot of people don't do meditation or back on meditation because they're looking to seek something out and like that's not the point the point is just to experience experience right look into yourself and look back at yourself yes and that's totally like not the same as drawing but the same concept of figure drawing at least is just being in the moment and observing like this is a like creation of whatever i don't know but i'm able to observe like here's a here's like a better way of saying it is like all we are is the universe folding in on itself 
to view itself. And that's the same thing as figure drawing. Amen, brother. Amen. Yep, you said it. Yeah, I mean, that's that's really why. And mm-hmm. you know, that's really why everybody should draw. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be a naked person. It could be a, a still life. Um, you know, it's easier if it's not human because that's the thing we're most critical of is what a finger looks like or a thumb mm-hmm. or, you know, how the elbow turns or the length of the forearm relative to the top part of your arm. It's, we all see that the minute it's a friggin' micro inch off. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like, totally. it's like, Oh, that sucks. It doesn't <laughs> look like it. But, um, if you push through that, uh, some great things happen. Totally. Yeah. Do you believe in karma? Karma. Well, I like instant karma, you know. Mm -hmm. (laughs) The jackass that speeds by and is pulled over, you know, up the road, you know, that that warms my heart sometimes. Um, You know, I I don't have – nothing's coming to mind as far as a specific – something that happened that's really just been more of a way of living Mm -hmm. for me and and an easy way to explain to my children um about what goes around comes around and about you know jesus is number one only Mm -hmm. really law is the golden one you know is there's a there's a reason we we do for others what you know, we would have done for ourselves. And, uh, and I think it's all just different ways of saying karma. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. It's a balance, you know, it's an energetic balance and, and whether it's money or emotions or, you know, uh, food, I don't know what it is, but it, it's all a store of, of energy that has to that has to balance out mm-hmm. um, for better and worse. Yeah. I like it. What has been your biggest struggle in life? Hmm. Struggles, uh, temper, mm-hmm. probably, like indulging in anger. Mm-hmm. Um has been a pretty lifelong thing I've been working on and very incrementally getting better at. I've, I've got a good, you know, my, my wife's a good partner in that. And she, she helps me recognize (laughs) some of those things. And, um, you know, I don't, I don't deny them or anything like that, but I've got to, um, yeah, I just I've been working on my temper for a long time, and yeah, just slowly getting better. Smoking weed helps a lot. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's what the last person said. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it helps me. Uh, it's it's easy it's easy to go to for a head change. Uh-huh. You know, like uh, for for positive or negative, but it, it could be it's just inviting a head change, like opening up a space to change my mind on something. And, you know, I could be angry, um, or I could just be kind of miffed or whatever, bad mood about whatever and smoke a bowl and just sort of open up to some other possibilities. How else do I want this to go? You know, what, what do I, okay. Yeah. I'm pissed off. What do I really want out of this? Is it, What's going to serve me by continuing down this path? Yeah, you I know? totally relate to that. I <laughs> yeah. totally like, like you watch, you know, you smoke weed and you watch like, like that's, that's true. But like you watch like a documentary about dolphins. You're like, well, how come dolphins are like that? Yeah. You know, because <laughs> right. like weed does give you that alternate perspective you would not have without it for sure. I totally get that. I like that a lot. Indeed. No, I think it's a great, it's great plant medicine mm-hmm. h- here for us at, grows out of the ground i guess you know god put it here along with all the other prepackaged stuff that grows right out of the ground 
called fruit and vegetables mm-hmm. um, for something, you know. You ever tried any psychedelic plants? <laughs> yeah, um, mushrooms are fun. And, you know, we usually, we've been into microdosing the last, I don't know, five, ten years. Mm-hmm. Where we'll just like, it's, you know, fun at work just to eat like a cap. Yeah. Yeah. And and then just kind of get a little bit of a head change that way. Or, um, you know, and we don't do that a ton. Um, I'm not as as into mushrooms. I, I um, did some ayahuasca once. Yeah. How was that? Yeah, that was that was really, um, really crazy. It's very healing. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, uh, that's another thing. You know, I think everybody should try that ayahuasca. And even mushrooms, you know, small small doses don't like eat a whole eighth. You don't need to do that. Um, but where'd you do ayahuasca at? Um, I did ayahuasca with a friend. It was his birthday. I think we were at Bass Lake. Oh, I think it's near. Um, uh, is it near Yosemite? Yeah, something like that. Yeah, and it was his birthday, and like we all met there, and it was just sort of part of the plan. And got a cabin, and um, we all drank it at the same time. And some of the guys, like you know, there's maybe six or eight guys there, and you know, a couple of the guys were puking because that typically you're supposed to puke. You're supposed to, yeah. And I, I didn't. I felt sick for you know a little bit, but never really had the need or desire to to puke and um once everybody kind of you know 45 minutes or an hour in as i remember and everybody was kind of on the level um there was a a wave to it Mm -hmm. that went where we would all be lucid and we would talk about how we were talking oh i feel like this and oh i'm like seeing this or i'm sensing this and we talk about kind of what we're feeling and thinking about, and then it would kind of fade and get really quiet for about 20, 30 minutes. And then we'd come back out all at the <laughs> same time. Mm-hmm. And again, we'd sort of like recollect. Oh, we'd... just in this dimension. Yeah, yeah. Oh, like... man, I was just talking about, oh, yeah, it was really crazy how we did this. Uh-huh. And and we do that for about 15, 20 minutes, and then, whew, yeah. and then off again. And we did that all night. Um, maybe four or five hours that went on and um, it was for me and a lot of us um, and uh, everybody else that I've ever heard talk about Alaska experiences um, a reflective and healing experience yeah and it was there was a sort of a life review I think that happened um, you know, in one of these sort of down periods, I was laying on a bed in one of the rooms and just sort of thinking about everything, you know, as it goes and really thinking about what I, what I want, you know, what I wanted from that point <clears throat> in my life and, um, kind of like not intending made some like final decisions, you know, about where I was, what was important to me and, where I was going for the rest of this life. What were those things? Well, it was just about like, it was about committing to family mm-hmm. and just, and really at that point I'd, I kind of, you know, I'd had a business and, and I'd ha- I'd had a fan, I had a family at that point and I would more or less unconsciously made this decision, I guess, cause I was, doing it i was raising a family and everything but easily distracted about oh maybe this opportunity or that opportunity you know like i'd i'd started another business with my um family and um it was i think right before that and and really like just getting distracted by all these different opportunities and things that I could maybe do in my life, but really at that point needed to decide what was most important. Would, would I be the type of dad and husband that was at work 12 hours a day or am, 
am I the type of dad or husband, you know, that's going to make my family a priority, you know, and my son wants to go jump on the trampoline. I almost never want to, but I do. And then I'm glad that I did, you know? (laughs) And, and so it was that kind of a decision, like the family's going to be the priority now. And, um, I'm not going to be the, the type of, uh, dad that regrets my time I'd, I'd had a son you know my son was born um a little bit before that uh, it went out on that so all this stuff is probably pretty natural to be thinking about mm-hmm. i don't know how old he was at that point maybe maybe four or five months old and um <clears throat> it was just like um Make, making those types of decisions and having these sorts of insights about the 40,000 foot view of my life path and kind of looking out ahead and seeing where I wanted it to generally be headed mm-hmm. toward. And, you know, it was that thing like, yeah, I don't want to be one of these 80 year old people that's full of regrets on, you know, on your deathbed, you know, you never wish you, you probably heard it, seen a meme or something that, you know, you never see, hear somebody on their deathbed wishing that they worked more or that they were more committed to their job or their career, you know, <laughs> or their it's business. True. And, true. and, and I'd always thought that. And my, my wife was a stylist before we met a very successful one and had, you know, had a lot of people in her chair, a lot of older, rich and older ladies and some famous people and stuff that would come to her. And, um, you know, when she would hear, she would hear over and over again, these regrets that the older folks would have about missing out on time with their family when they had the chance. Yeah. You know, so it was like, well, you know, I at least have to play as hard as I'm going to work. But, um, that said, family is also a lot of work. And, um, so that's got to be my, the work that is my priority. And it was, you know, all this stuff, sort of these sorts of things during that trip, um, kind of amalgamated, if that's the word into, a nice little life review that for the following days, I just felt amazing. Like the next day, a lot of times, you know, it's not like drinking at all. Um, really nothing else is as horrible as drinking, but (laughs) I hate drinking, you know, like I don't hate it, but I have my opinion. on Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's poisonous. It's gross. Um, but the, the next day I felt amazing. Uh, the next few days I felt amazing and really felt a, distinct sense of healing that had taken place and I probably don't even have I obviously don't have the adequate words to to say the full encompassment of yeah of the energetic experience that it was but you know that said I think everyone should do it I think it's a it's should be a rite of passage for you know maybe a 21 25 year old guy to you know, somewhere around that age between there and 40, uh, try some Alaska, you know, (laughs) keep that, put that on my, yeah. To do list. To do list. Yeah. (laughs) So with that, what was your rock bottom? Well, like I was saying earlier, I've Jacob honestly had a, a a pretty damn good life Mm -hmm. and, and I'm, you know, always, um, I just can't be grateful enough for it because I'm also acutely aware of the suffering that goes on, uh, all around us. So with, Oh, sorry. So with that, what advice would you give? Well, I, I guess, you know, my rock bottom, Mm -hmm. my rock bottom, uh, that just like springs to mind right now. when you say that not trying not to edit too much Mm -hmm is the first heartbreak that I had 
you know. Mm-hmm. And I was I was obviously young. I was in high school or something. Um, but that to me was was really tough. You know, that was really painful. Um, and then, you know, I guess heartbreak in general, because I would kind of, I think through it, like, yeah, all the, you know, all the other heartbreaks are pretty shitty too. And I, I fear that the most, I think for my son, not so much my daughter. Um, uh, but I think, um, heartbreak was really the toughest has, has been one of the tougher things for me to deal with in all its different forms. Um, and how to deal with that is, um, you know, it's, you just got to go one day at a time, you know? Like any bad day, Mm -hmm. like any bad day, it's, you know, everything's a little bit different when you wake up the next day. And so just, you know, give it a day kind of thing. Keep giving it a day, day at a time. Mm -hmm. Um, That said, I'm in the best relationship, you know, of my life right now. And my my wife is just a dream boat. And I tell her that all the time. Um, So... I just, I guess, you know, that's one of my big fears is that loss of love and, and, and just because it's been such a source of pain for me. And, um, you know, I think because of that, I've deliberately blocked a lot of the, those things out when they do happen or, you know, like when I go through bad breakup it's like the the ones last ones that I you know remember it was like a definite decision you know it's like whether she's leaving me or I'm leaving her or whatever it's just like you know at some point it the it's a switch that is flipped and it's like it compartmentalizes that whole relationship into a box yeah that I rarely reflect on Mm -hmm. and even forget parts of it you know I was with I was married before I have an ex-wife and um, I don't think about our time together I don't really if I try even try to remember you know try to just like remember something you know yeah it's it's not easy to dig something up because I've just kind of built a a wall around that whole that whole time and sometimes I'll have to go in there to like pluck out other relationships that I had and to like try to remember stuff. But, um, that's, uh, that's how I, you know, kind of dealt with that. And I don't know that that's the best way to do it (laughs) because (laughs) I'm, um, uh, just memory in general is like, you know, I think I like to think one day I'll be able to recall more memories about my life than than I can mm-hmm. at any given moment. You know, I'm uh, 45, and so like, what can I remember from when I was 25? You know, mm-hmm. or or 19 for that matter. And um, I have this idea like one day if I'm ever bored enough or feel that it's important enough for some reason to, you know, write my life story down um, for whoever would care to read it. Like maybe if I started that process, I would remember, Yeah. you know, or maybe if I, uh, worst case scenario, maybe I get a hypnotherapist and I do some <laughs> <laughs> like regression you know, or more ayahuasca. Yeah, or more ayahuasca could be something. I didn't get any like real like specific trippy visuals or anything. Uh huh. But I've never done LSD. Um, what about the DMT? Same thing as ayahuasca. DMT is a concentrated form of ayahuasca, and yeah. I am interested in that. Um, totally. I have not tried it. I've had friends that I guess they'd smoke it on over like 
put it over a bowl of weed or something and then they'd yeah then they'd uh smoke it and they'd like go trans-dimensional for totally. like 15 20 minutes and yeah. talk to these insectoids go, yeah dude yeah total rick and morty shit right there okay <laughs> <laughs> yeah i've never done it but yeah i'm just i've like i said i've heard stories you yeah know. same same deal and i know our body makes dmt yeah. you know and um everything does like truly everything it's in everything which is the craziest part mm-hmm. and I've, I've heard that like our brain produces it when we dream when we yeah. die yeah. when we're born so it's like that's some crazy shit right there. yeah yeah it's in that center part of your brain um they talk about it being calcified all the time mm-hmm. and um it it calcifies from lack of use and well like the reason you drink al- alawaska is because your body knows exactly what to do with the dmt so it's just instantly gone but yeah. if you drink the the alawaska so it creates like a amino acid inhibitor or whatever big science words right uh-huh. <laughs> that makes it the, so the dmt actually reacts with your brain the way it's supposed to yeah or i guess not the way it's supposed to because the way it's supposed to you're supposed to just be like oh i'm good yeah that's chemical of reality or spirit molecule, molecule yeah. as they say yeah right yeah no it's uh it's very interesting and and maybe one day i'll get my hands on some totally yeah so two more questions yes everything i kind of asked you this already but any anything everything you've been through what would just be your general advice to someone okay my general advice of uh i guess for better living or something um um and i don't have a a long list of things Mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be it doesn't have to be (laughs) but i would say you know do what you say you're gonna do Mm -hmm. that's it you know like just be be a person of your word a human of your word um and you'll go far you know um be clear be consistent and um yeah just persevere stick with it keep your eye on the prize you know <laughs> what? that's good advice no one's ever said that before that's okay really good. yeah yeah so that's that's my immediate answer. Um, I haven't written out my entire philosophy yet, mm-hmm. so uh, stay tuned. Stay tuned. I was about <laughs> to say that. So, last question, okay? How do I grow a beard like that? <laughs> just, just let it grow, man. Uh-huh. Just keep, just keep going and do nothing. That's yeah. what I tell everybody. I've heard that if you eat eggs and spinach, your gr- your beard would grow faster. Your beard would grow faster. Uh-huh. Sure, sure. Yeah, so it has you- like the chemicals that uh-huh. your produces, right? <laughs> Yeah, I I recommend whatever you can do to get your testosterone just jacked up. Maybe mm-hmm. that would help. Totally. And <laughs> and uh yeah, I've had a beard since I was I started shaving when I was 13, I think. <laughs> don't Wow. <laughs> don't ever shave. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think I could ever look at you the same without a beard. Yeah, yeah, I I shaved a couple years ago. I didn't shave. I cut my beard off. It was probably down to my my belly. Wow. And um, I was getting tired of it, getting caught in things, and it was kind of hot. And so I just, you know, had my, my wife won't shave it since, because when we met, I didn't have a beard. Mm-hmm. Came back from a camping trip once, and um, she was all hot and bothered and just wouldn't let me shave it ever again. And she cuts my hair and, and keeps me good looking and stuff. But she Totally. Cut, she does a good job. Yeah, but she, she won't cut my, thank you, she won't cut my beard. <laughs> Um, but I, I managed to talk her into cutting it off that, that year just so it was short and, yeah. um, people didn't recognize, you know, <laughs> people up here cause I grew my beard out shortly before we moved up here. So I've ever only ever been known as a bearded human here, but, um, for the whole rest of my life, I've been clean shaven and, uh, naked faced as my wife would say. And, um, Yeah. It's it's pretty trippy being a bearded individual now cuz I never I never thought I was the type honestly mm-hmm. you know but uh, here we are cool yeah <laughs> i like it <laughs>
Cool. Thank you for your time. Oh, yeah. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed that episode. Be sure to follow my social media accounts for news and updates on future episodes. Links will be down below.